Well, since you've uncharacteristically all gone quiet, uh, I, I think we'll start with proceedings in that case. Um, a very warm welcome to you, and uh, it's a rather unusual experience that uh, this is probably the most populated part of the House, House of uh, uh, Houses of Parliament today, because uh, the House isn't sitting. Um, we're back tomorrow. Originally, this was going to be a sitting day, but it's great to see so many people decided to come along nevertheless you know um, and you can sort of roam free around the building of course um, <laughs> while there's no MPs around um, so it's, it's very good to see you but now um, we are moving um, as part of our program to really our third pillar um, uh, of our program for this 1920 season so to speak and we're moving on this time to citizen participation and we're particularly going to be focusing on the um, area of diversity, which, uh, you know, whatever report it is, you will find uh, diversity written absolutely large, uh, and quite rightly, because, um, uh, let's face it, the development and application of AI, if it's not done and developed uh, by a diverse workforce, has a huge risk attached to it in terms of bias, and not recognising bias either. So uh, I think you know, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, uh, in uh, uh, regulatory, um, at the regulatory aspect of AI, whether you're um, uh, in the tech industry yourself, uh, whether you're in any other um, part of the uh, forest, so to speak, diversity is looming very large. And one of the big question marks is what to do about it. Um, I've just been reading Amy Webb's book called The Big Nine. Um, really interesting book, actually. Um, you know, you, you tend to uh, think that um, a lot of AI books are a bit samey, but this is, I think, rather well written. And she talks about AI tribes, but she doesn't use the word AI tribes in a sort of flattering way, um, because really she thinks of it as being a very undiverse group of people historically, um, especially. Um, after the post-war period when, strangely enough, there were many, many more women involved, um, you know, as a result of being in Bletchley Park and so on, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the technology workforce. Um, but that sadly changed during the 60s and 70s, um, until now when really we're trying to kind of reverse the trend. So I'm personally looking forward very much to um, uh, hearing uh, across the full range of uh, diversity issues um, in this area uh, as we go forward. And um, Kriti Sharma uh, uh, gave evidence, so very uh, nice to see you again, Kriti Sharma. Uh, Kriti Sharma gave us uh, evidence to our um, House of Lords Select Committee, uh, and that was one of the reasons why we were so keen on the diversity agenda um, as part of that report as well. Um, and uh, she is a, the founder, a founder of AI for Good, uh, and uh, uh, it says here, and no doubt, Preeti, if you just give us a little bit, bit of your own background, she built her first robot at the age of 15. Well, I can't say that that of many people, I suspect. Um, so, Preeti, over to you. Thank you. Uh, the first robot I built at the age of 15, um, I created it to fetch Snickers, the chocolate from the snack bar. So you don't have to be very fast. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here, um, especially again, the follow up from the House of Lords report. Um, almost uh, over a year and a half ago now. Um, I Just by way of background, I'm a computer scientist, um, trained into machine learning and data sciences, inventory creating data and AI teams for large organizations like Barclays, Sage, a lot of my research was funded by Google. And um, I went through that entire phase without ever having to realize that I was one of the more diverse people in the teams. I just went about creating my technologies and tools um, without even realizing that there was such a thing as diversity issues. And if you meet a lot of geeks like myself, you will see that there's a, uh, there's a lack of uh, understanding of the wider impact. That was pretty much at the earlier stages of my career. Um, these days, I do better things with my life than fetching, sneakers fetching, robot building. Um, I've uh, set up a social enterprise called AI for Good, um, which is allowed to come up a lot of work and research I've been doing over the last few years. And we, train, we create solutions to very difficult social challenges. For example, tools that help predict risk of domestic violence or sex education in countries like India. And also training young people from diverse backgrounds into the field of, um, of AI. Um, what I wanted to specifically talk about today with regards to diversity, uh, yes, the issues in 
tools and products that are created by less diverse teams are very obvious, and they have now become mainstream news headlines. So that's, that's very positive. Um, I want to talk about diversity in two different ways. One is the people who are coming into the workforce, or much younger generation, those in schools, um, and those who are actually in the workforce, like myself. And these are the issues here are, are very different when it comes to diversity. Um, I'll give you an example um, of some of the diversity challenges I face myself. Like many people who work in, uh, in computing or technology, I contribute to open source code and, and forums where my people come together and build these tools. And I noticed something quite interesting. When I logged in with my own name and my face, my own picture, and started to work on these projects, I got a lot of questions like, what makes you qualified to know about AI? What makes you think you know machine learning? And so I changed my profile picture to that of a cat with a jetpack on it, because um, I'm cool. <laughs> and now those comments went away. I have several degrees in computer science and have years of experience in this field, and yet I have to hide my gender in order for my work to be taken seriously. And that's the problem with people who are in this field today. We hear about the numbers in the reports that diversity, women is as of 12%, but you look at ethnic minorities, even worse. But it's also about the quality of work for those 12%, which is not in an optimal space. The second space of my group I wanted to talk about is young people who are coming into this field. In the UK, in particular, it's done a great job at funding more master's programs and more PhDs and creating more opportunities for people in the field of AI. But I'm worried about those who are the 15-year-old version of me or better version of me who are not necessarily considering a career in this field. Not that everybody needs to, but they should all have the opportunity to experience what this field is like and what it has to offer. I spoke with a lot of them, and over the last year, um, I've personally talked to about 150 young people in this country. And we noticed um, three key barriers to getting them, and these are very diverse, back, people from diverse backgrounds, 50 50 gender split, various socioeconomic backgrounds. And we noticed three problems. First, they don't think they're smart enough to create a career in the field of AI because there's a certain, there's a certain perception of what a person who works in this field needs to look like. Second, they weren't sure where to begin. They're not getting the right skills from their teachers in, in schools. Uh, and sometimes they know more than their computer science teachers, which creates a weird dynamic. And thirdly, they would want to do something more interesting or more creative, like become a YouTube star, which I think is a fair argument. Um, but working with these kids, I learned that they have a huge amount of potential. And um, when they work together, they're building AI tools. A lot of the fear and stigma and worries about this technology goes away. And we see a lot more focus on social justice related projects, things that create a better society rather than yet another advertising business or an algorithm that does more racial profiling. And so I feel very optimistic in, um, overall about the potential of what we can achieve if we are able to activate this diverse group of people and improve the quality of life at work for those who are more than the 12% or the 17% figures. Great. Um, just let me ask you, I mean, some of this is about values, isn't it? I mean, and how do you get across this? Issue? It isn't purely about the technical expertise at all, is it? Because in a sense, you know, a diverse development community, diverse tech community, in a sense, um, uh, develops different values to one that's the monoculture. I mean, what kind of values do you think we're trying to uh, build it, 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 it with a more diverse community? I, I think when you have um, people from different groups, firstly the products are more interesting and, and better, uh, the services, and I've had most fun when I'm working with people who are not just all from the same background, and they come from different fields, um, whether they're anthropologists, linguists, ethicists, lawyers, um, I find it's, it's really interesting. There are challenges when you're communicating with people from very different backgrounds. And I tend to look at my teams that I work with, I often see two kinds of people. Those who are puzzle solvers, who are fascinated by mathematical statistical puzzles, and those who are interested in solving problems that impact society in the short term and the long term. And I think the values that we need to create are the ones that satisfy both. I used to think it could be one or the other. And if I build the most amazing product and the most efficient algorithm, they will be fine, but we have seen 
consequences of that on society. Um, and on the other hand, it can't just be um, people applying this technology to probably have to create core, core research. So the values that we need to cultivate in these teams are those um, that cater to people from all of these backgrounds and, um, and ultimately think about the people they're serving uh, with, with these capabilities. Um, a lot of it can be structured because um, you can embed the process of designing diverse programs, diverse software, diverse technologies um, in, the, in the process of how technology is developed in the life cycle of creating it. And we have great evidence of doing this really well with the computing field. Uh, we've done great processes embedded in you know, new technologies and new capabilities, and we do especially when you look at tools like cybersecurity and user testing, we've developed hard, hardened processes to check for all of these points. You should be able to check for the diversity in the products and services we go to. Thank you. That's a really interesting distinction between the kinds of individuals who get into AI. And we just hold, hold that for and see whether people agree uh, further down the track as we come into the discussion. Um, and now I've got um, Sarah Wrench, who has the great title of Advanced Analytics, Robots and AI Senior Leader. It's what we all aspire to, uh, mm -hmm. Sarah. Um, and uh, then we also have Adrian Joseph, who is the head of uh, EY's uh, uh, AI practice in Europe, am I, am I right, Adrian? Yeah. Uh, and who's a partner of EY. Thank you. Over to <coughs> either or both of you, simultaneously or <laughs> just. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, I definitely thought it was worth having both of us, and it's great to see actually a, a very strong female panel today, actually. Um, so actually, I've made it more diverse by bringing it. Um, yeah, I know. It's definitely not diverse. But with that, with that, I thought it was because we both bring different perspectives. So I'm going to allow Adrian to intro and highlight some of the kind of initial thoughts we had kind of representing UI, and then myself will close and kind of the key takeaways. Yeah, so, uh, so thank you um, very much. I, I also, um, in my spare time, I'm an NED uh, to the UK government, so I advise the Home Office and the Cabinet Office on, on things like this. Diversity. So you're responsible. Ah, oh, for <laughs> yeah. I'm irresponsible, I normally get called, but I, I like you all to turn better at being responsible. Um, so uh, we've seen a lot, and I uh, pretty completely agree with your comments around, we've seen a lot of the, the unforeseen or unintended sort of negative impacts on diversity and inclusion, um, some of which I think have come through really clearly from uh, people like Joy Bulani, who is uh, an MIT professor, a poet, and also uh, a TED talker. And, um, uh, you know, we've seen it in the justice system, in recruitment, and in many, many areas. Um, but, but at the same time, we've also seen artificial intelligence have a positive impact on diversity and inclusion. I don't think that's an area that has been focused on as much. So just to give you a couple of examples of uh, a startup company that's developing uh, technology to help see the hidden gender bias in their writing, for example. So it's got a tone meter to detect the gender tone of uh, job descriptions, you know, and so forth. Um, there are other examples of a, a very large FMCG company that um, you don't get to meet a person until you've been through three of their algorithms um, in, the, in the hiring uh, process, the recruitment process. And they found that actually they got the best diversity and inclusion that they'd ever achieved previously. So, you know, there are examples of where we're seeing diversity and inclusion uh, improved. Another example would be um, one of the products that one of the big technology companies have created that allows you to look at a, a, a data set of faces to discern whether or not there's bias in your data to, to begin with. So, you know, the very good examples, I think, of, of where we've seen this work. Now is a really good time to be having this conversation. Um, the EU have just published their guidelines on uh, ethical and trustworthy use of artificial intelligence, which leads on a human-centric approach, and they specifically call out that AI should not be gender biased or ethnicity biased or disability biased or any of those biases and so now is a really good time uh, to be having the conversation. One of the things that um, we would observe is um, that it's really hard to get the data on how many people are actually, you know, the diversity uh, profile of people actually working in artificial intelligence. Um, and, and so, you know, we look at broader statistics around STEM profiling and so on and of course we see you know that it's very heavily skewed towards towards men and, and particular you know particular profiles and I, I would I, in my own experience interactions you know that seems to be replicated in terms of artificial intelligence but beginning to think of 
um, you know, one tracking the data um, in the same way that we would uh, for diversity inclusion in pretty much any other any other area. But then also think about the new skills that are coming through, you know, of ethicists and creative profiles that we need to have to have a balanced discussion around, uh, you know, true diversity and inclusion in the world of AI. So with that, I'll hand over to Sarah to talk about some specific actions that we think uh, you might want to consider. So yeah, so we pointed out with point one that we want to identify the processes where may, AI might be having unintended negative consequences on, on diversity and inclusion, um, particularly in recruitment and progression and performance. And um, so that's referencing the tool that Adrian spoke about by looking at the sentiment of job posts and things like that. Point two, we said that um, externally looking at external communication. So again, you can use image recognition software to look at kind of the diversity <coughs> all the imagery that's being used and even sentiment analysis on messaging by corporations to check that actually it's being inclusive and actually encouraging a diverse workplace, again, promoting the company to hire externally a diverse culture. And finally, three, supporting that inclusiveness in the workplace. So how do we use AI to ensure people with all different backgrounds and disabilities are able to work in that place? Um, to give one personal example, uh, I'm actually a diabetic. You wouldn't know it looking at me, but nowadays you have devices which can continuously monitor your blood sugar. Uh, in wearing an Apple Watch, therefore enabling me to function and no one would be aware that I'm diabetic. So enabling things that people can work from anywhere at home, um, whether it's audio devices or NLP think and video conferencing systems, enabling them, them to all have a place in the workplace and be provided insight. This also helps contribute to them um, any models or anything being built being more diverse. And again, I think picking up on your point, making sure a key part that we talked about was having access to that data. So there's a huge call to ensure that any data that's being um, used uh, is basically being analysed by a diverse kind of workforce, but equally making sure that the data coming in is diverse and be any outputs coming out, again, are challenged or looked at to make sure that the outputs are there. And those are our key core points. Thank you. Uh, 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 that's a really interesting um, sort of unpacking of, of your actions and your research. But what I, what I thought was very interesting, uh, Adrian, is you mentioned that algorithmic selection actually uh, potentially was better already than uh, human selection in a sense. I mean, I, it's not quite the it's not quite the opposite because I think you said it went through three stages before it actually got, before recruits actually got to see a human, so to speak. But as a result of the algorithmic filtering, so to speak, being, um, uh, you know, sufficiently diverse or trained to be sufficiently diverse, that actually the recruitment was better. I mean, is that, is that the experience? Yeah, that's right. In this, in this particular example, of, um, you had to get through three different algorithms before you got to, to, to meet, meet a person. Um, and have a you know face-to-face -face interaction and, and, and interview. So um, you know I think it's important to, 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 to also you know we, we, we can learn a lot from the negative examples, but I'm also keen. We were very keen to highlight some of the positive examples of how AI is already improving diversity and inclusion and to feed that that into the mix. And how do you? I mean, you you. you Sounded quite confident about some of the steps. I mean, is that it, 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 it was this part of a deliberate um, program, basically? Um, was it was this highly strategic, or has it just happened? I, think, I think it. I think it, I don't think um, the intention. I think was more um, obvious in the sense of um, perhaps improving efficiency and so on, which is what they found. But almost, um, I don't know whether this was intentional or not, but certainly. Um, you know, in addition to improving efficiency, um, it, it gave them the best, the best, the best diversity that they, they've ever achieved in on this particular um, uh, experiment. So, um, whether it was intentional or not, um, we've ended up with you know better outcomes than we might have otherwise. Yeah, interesting. Did, just one point did you actually, want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, it's a slightly separate point, and I should have brought up in the inclusive in the workplace. Um, as one of the people who lead what we call the EY and um, Women in Tech boot camps, what we hold is internal training for people in Python and R. I think we've trained about 3,000 people in terms of. a frightening organisation to work for. But actually, the point is, is it's open to, to anyone. So, And actually, what was interesting is we looked at the output of the classes and we actually had 40% um, kind of male attendance. So, what we sure saw here is actually something 
where people are in 60% female. So what the positive output was actually we had a huge number of people, all genders coming, um, and all diversity, and, and that enabled people to learn, get more into AI, and then take the skills and go on to do more online training, which again is accessible to everyone throughout the company. Great. Thank you very much. And now on to um, uh, uh, Sarah uh, Conecio Cervantes, um, who is uh, an or the ambassador uh, for teams in AI. You're very welcome, Sarah. Thank you. It's uh, really nice being here and seeing such a good turnout today. Hopefully, we can make some good development in creating diverse and inclusive AI. So, I just wanted to start off by telling a bit about myself and how I ended up being here. So, as I mentioned before, a year and a half ago, the House of Lords released their report about um, AI in the UK, and um, I ended up reading it and writing a response. It's compulsive reading, I can tell you. Yeah, that was quite long. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, I ended up writing um, a response to that uh, from a youth perspective. So, at the time, I, I was only 16, and um, I talked more about the education side and looking more about healthcare because I think quite a lot of young people are more passionate about that side rather than like marketing and strategy. Um, so I touched you about how AI can really be embedded into the healthcare and the education system. So starting off with, with um, healthcare, like hopefully in the future it can reduce biases that are already implemented into the systems. So one example that occurs is fertility, and um, so depending on like your postcode, it's more likely for you to get certain types of treatment in your area. And um, IVF is something that has particularly gone into that. So if you live in north of London, it's more likely for you to be able to be treated more than one times. Whilst if you're more in the south coast, then you're more unlikely to. Um, this is something that's like currently occurring and something that needs to be looked upon and just by having more diverse data um, that's being collected and more valuable data, some of these issues can be reduced by looking at that. So looking more into the education side, um, as someone who is currently in education, um, a lot of people and a lot of young people quite look at how the education system isn't built up in the modern world that we live in. It's not up to date, it's not currently looking at the issues that young people are facing. And I think AI and technology can really be brought into this. And by having diversity, like teens and AI, we, we do hackathons every um, three months or so, and we bring in kids from the ages of 12 to 18, um, we bring them all together from all different backgrounds, different incomes, different races, gender, and we put them in different teams. We give them a problem to solve, whether that's looking at climate change, voting systems, um, looking at accountability and responsibility, things like that, which they all learn about, they all recognise, they all go and do research, and using AI as one of their tools, they end up making products. So we had a Generation Z hack back in January and one of the uh, applications that were made was a team came up with a chatbot that would help you learn about voting for young people in particular because we're not really taught about key, um, key life skills at school, things like that, um, which I don't know, blows my mind. Um, but so these apps, that the kids came up with, they programmed it um, over two days. They were able to build a chat box which allowed you to learn about like what Brexit was, like um, how to vote, where your nearest voting uh, polling station is, all these different aspects. And it's so fascinating to see these really young people from the, from, from the ages of 12 being able to be part of this community and learn and understand how and it's building itself. However, Diversity is a big issue, and I think where we need to tackle it and spend more time is ensuring that young people have role models that look like them, so that they're not scared off or unwanting to go in the field because there's either, oh look, there's no one that looks like me, like how am I going to make it through if there's no one that is similar to me that already has. So there is a lot of companies that are already doing this, such as Acorn and Teens and AI, Stemets, that are already pushing through these barriers. 
but I think it's up to the government to take in place to start to consider how this can be implemented into the education system already, whether that's through doing problem solving classes or specific um, like setting tasks over a long period of time rather than learning to pass an exam, which is what ends up happening the majority of the time. And just to finish off, um, I think it would be really good for the government to implement different schemes to allow people of different backgrounds to ensure that they are wanting to come into the, into the field and breaking through those stereotypes as you mentioned previously, like what a computer scientist looks like. And these are things that governments could be doing with different schemes and working with other companies that are already doing it. Thank you very much. Really interesting because, I mean, you have quite a tech education uh, in your background, don't you? And yet, what you have done is you kind of reached out across the uh, barriers uh, in a way by making it relevant in terms of climate change and other aspects that you demonstrated the relevance of AI in other disciplines and so on. I mean, how important do you think it is um, uh, to have, uh, if you like, your STEM education in order to get into this? Or do you think um, it is quite possible to, you know, be in other disciplines, humanities and so on, and still uh, be able to make a contribution in the whole sort of AI field and so on? So I think a lot of people do talk about AI and look behind the STEM and like make sure that you know how to program and things like that. But actually at the, ev at the event, some of them are only two days. So we actually teach um, the teens more about like the responsibility behind creating AI, like the ethics, the importance of considering morality, the data that you're using. And I think it's all of these different skills that you learn as well as being able to work with other people who are not similar to you, being able to pitch your ideas to companies to make sure that you're able to get funding. And I think there's so much more behind it than just what programming is. And I think a lot of people do confuse the fact that AI is more than just programming. It's more than just like setting up some coders. It's like to do with ensuring that people have a voice, like you're able to create products for people. Um, whether that's through like looking at different things you're interested in, and so not just looking at them. Great, and very much uh, that very much hits the kind of uh, thing that Kriti was talking about, uh, making sure you cover both types of people in terms of getting their interest in in this field. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. And now on to Jay-Z Young, um, who's the lead consultant for AI strategy and ethics. And for methods, now I think you're going to have to tell us what methods, it sounds very mysterious. Thank you for having me here today, it's great to be here. And methods is, uh, we're a small consultancy that does a lot of work with government clients mainly on digital transformation. And we've recently set up an emerging tech practice to look at how emerging technologies like artificial intelligence will impact the public sector. Um, how it can be used in a way that aligns with government strategy is also considering the ethics of its impact. Um, so for example, it's not just tech for tech's sake, but really thinking very critically about, you know, AI is um, fundamentally different as a type of technology, and so the impact it can have on citizens on government services is immense, and we need to think very carefully and very, um, in a very considered way about how we apply that. And so we sort of come at the technology from that perspective. So, sort of what I'm going to share today is a reflection on that. Um, I've also uh, done some research looking at how do you build feminist chatbots. Uh, so, thinking about the different tools we have at our disposal to create technology that um, you know has considered social impact. Um, and also, a quick note: I don't have a technical background. I couldn't code anything to save my life. Um, and uh, so, I've got a sort of social impact political science background. And so I sort of come at it from that perspective. And what I'd like to talk about today is the, how diversity actually drives innovation um, and the, the connection between those two things. And I think when we talk about diversity and in artificial intelligence, we should be focusing on the fact that there is an overabundance of a homogenous group rather than necessarily a deficiency of a different group. So you know, why is this overabundance? Um, why does it exist and what can we do about it? And I think one of the risks we have with overabundance is that it stifles innovation. So when you have a, a homogenous group developing something, 
it means there's only a small percentage of sort of perspectives that are able to consider the ways in which the AI products are being designed and deployed, and it leads to groupthink. And I think that leads to uh, poor identification of risks, poor identification of potential innovation opportunities, but also it can lead to the codification of kind of world views based on the kind of perspectives of a small number of people. And that's why that's where we get into issues around reinforcing structural inequality. So we found through our work um, is that when you have homogenous teams, you do have this group think. Um, it blocks innovation, new perspectives and ways of doing things are less likely to be considered. Um, and also we think in this context around how AI is being built, which has always been already been mentioned by a number of people, is that um, diversity is also skills and mindset, as well as demographic markers we need you know, a team building some kind of AI product or system, I think it's to look very different, you also need to have different types of brains in the room. You know, you, have, you need to have your data scientists and your ethnographers, um, your engineers as well as your user researchers. You know, the combining of all these great skills is what leads to greater innovation, but also picking up on issues that um, an AI system might reinforce um, in terms from a social impact perspective. So we try to do that in our work and we, uh, I think it'd be safe to say that we're really proud of the progress we're making in terms of about how we think about how we resource our AI projects, but it has been challenging, I think, to, in certain situations, to create a safe and productive space for all those different skills and perspectives to be heard within a team environment, within a kind of day-to-day -day running project. So there's something around our kind of our mental muscles about how it actually supports spaces that are diverse and that can work productively to create AI systems and projects. We also think that there's something about the tools that we use to build this technology. We use Agile in our work and we love it, it's great, but it, there aren't necessarily explicit tools around you know, supporting a diverse team to work well together, but also thinking critically around the ethical and social impacts of the products that someone's making. So with my chatbot research, I've developed a feminist chatbot design tool, uh, which basically supports teams of any makeup to think really critically about their design of their chatbot. What, how is that going to impact the people who are, you know, destined to use that chatbot? And really, I guess, challenge their assumptions as a team about what, um, you know, they think is kind of, I guess, positive or negative about their design with a view to making their design better as a result. So, so we're doing a lot of work internally to address, um, you know, how do we run an agile process that embeds tools like the UK government's data ethics framework, dot everyone's consequence mapping tool, um, how do we make those kind of normal in our day-to-day -day practice, and also thinking critically about how do we recruit and retain diverse teams um, that can then be work in a productive and safe way to create better technology. And I think there's there's something around changing our mindset about what conditions we need to have in place to have a thriving AI system or industry. And that you know diversity isn't something that we solve, it's a precondition to success. It's a precondition to innovation. Great, thank you very much indeed. I loved um, your overabundance of a homogenous group. I, I thought immediately of culling of some sort, you know, um, uh, in the first well, in, any other, in any other context you, you, you think about. It. Um, and your feminist uh, chatbot clearly needs to be uh, licensed to Amazon and Apple uh, instantly. Um, but let me just ask you, I mean, you do a lot of work with government. Do you think the challenges with government are greater than they are with, in the private sector, or do you think government actually, once you once they've got it, do it? I mean, is there a difference, or do you think they're pretty much the same? It's it's getting that culture right, which is the real challenge. Yeah, I think I actually think government is really well placed to lead in this space. I think government's off to a head start. Government already has policy people who know what social impact looks like. They already have customer, you know, uh, call centres and stuff that know what people are talking about. So I think. Government's off to a head start um, in terms of having the skills to think critically about these kinds of things. 
um, and resolve issues as they come up in terms of how technology is designed and deployed. But I think as well, things like the government digital service service standards that mandate user research, that you know, there's a kind of a gateway process that says if your, um, your thing that you want to deploy on gov.uk hasn't had rigorous user research, doesn't you know, fit these accessibility requirements, you don't get to make it live. Like those get, gatekeeping in that way, I think, is really effective <coughs> to make sure products, when they are released, do hit all those important standards. So I think government could really be innovating in a really interesting way, using those frameworks and drawing on their kind of policy expertise. Great. I hope that we'll have to report that and send that to the, um, the digital minister in that case. Um, and, you know, because that's, that's quite optimistic, but you know, you're, you're right in saying there's a potential there. Uh, because they, they actually should have the understanding of the issues involved. Thank you. Um, and now over to Maria Accenti, who is in this country, you know, strangely enough, just momentarily, I'm sure. Um, uh, but uh, she is described as the AI program driver, so I think we should be very afraid. Um, uh, and, but over to you, Maria. I'm a, I'm a good driver. I mean, I like from law and I'm a bit of an aggressive driver. I don't don't tell anyone. So um, thank you for having me here. Fantastic views. I think we lift the diversity panel mantra. So hopefully my point of view will connect, connect it all. Um, so uh, to mention, I'm uh, part of the uh, Center of Excellence for PwC and uh, I'm coming with a background in strategy and digital transformation. And one of my passion is how do we bring everything together? How do we bring different pieces in this AI story? to make sense for a profound change that's sustainable. Uh, so my, my look at diversity for AI will have a bit of a strategic overview. First of all, understanding where is inequality coming and how can we address it in a way that's sustainable and will produce the changes we expect. So first, a bit of a look at history, because I'm a bit of a uh, history junk. Um, in the first industrial revolution, um, when uh, industrialization and productivity um, had experienced a rapid growth, we uh, put a lot of value on the members of society that will produce growth. And throughout time, slowly, we start to marginalize those who are not all too young or too old to work. And even slowly, slow, slower, um, we created those growing separation between generations. Um, patterns of behavior that we inherit today. Fast forward in 2019, and ageism is yet another form of inequality and exclusion alongside gender and race uh, in AI and across society. But hey ho, AI is here to, to, to trigger a profound social revolution. And although we see day-to-day -day examples of AI uh, being unfair to a certain group of people from uh, the now famous compass tool using predictive policing in the US to the um, uh, Amazon uh, recruitment tool that was uh, part because it was biased uh, against towards men, I think what those tools do in a more positive outlook is show light or slow light on where inequality exists, and that exists be beyond data and algorithms in, in our processes, in our culture, in our norms. And for us to be able to, to, to actually solve it, we need to be looking at all those places. And rather than looking at AI as a black mirror, as to so many have, have started to, to, to kind of uh, make us think, maybe we should have a more positive impact. Uh, maybe AI will help us find out what's not working quite well with us as a human race. But what can we do? What can we do that it's, it's, a, it's a set of action on long term? And I'll quote a um, American president, since today is the latest the American president, Lyndon Johnson, the 36th president of the United States, who said something like, the great social change tends to come rapidly in periods of intense activity and progress before the impulse slows. We must open the door of opportunity, but we must also equip our people to all throws to those. I think it is an excellent statement that's not just very relevant today in the age of AI, but also a great example to follow. Balance creating opportunities we're actually helping diverse groups to participate. 
one of the recommendations will be to look at um, diversity <coughs> in AI and for AI as a cultural transformation effort. So we've done this, we've quite experienced it, especially in corporation managing culture, right? So we have done it for uh, previous waves of uh, technology implementation. And in this, with this view, we use a methodology that looks at top-down and bottom-up. That means that the leaders um, is in their remit to create those opportunities that create the um, upskilling programs, but also we need a little bit of leadership from everyone, everyone to contribute, to be able to, to, to take the initiatives, to be able to participate and include themselves as long as others create the opportunities. But inclusion, and diversity uh, wouldn't be possible if people who are expected to participate will not have the right level of awareness of what's going on. And we've heard so many, so many calls for a proper um, and, um, we we'll say, down to earth um, AI literacy. Right. So we are all in desperate need to understand what AI is at school, at work, uh, in traffic, and in every single aspect of our lives. And I think in order for us to expect people to participate, we need to uh, educate them. We need to help them understand what they are is. Um, and I think that, that can be done in, in multiple ways. Once addressing um, the formal education, supporting the inclusion of AI-specific subjects within the current curriculum, supporting things in AI and other initiatives uh, with funding and proper recognition and the impact they have in education. But also really important, um, Looking at a program like Elements of AI, which is by now the famous uh, Finnish uh, online course that at this moment has been taken by 140,000 students from 80 countries to <coughs> learn what AI is. Um, and uh, as, as far as we've seen, I think that they are reaching for a global audience. And it will be interesting to see how people who took this course, what will be their reaction, how they, they use that knowledge into their <coughs> AI. Of course, um, another um, interesting and uh, helpful initiative to empower young people to join technology career, and especially young girls, will be Tech and Water. And to, uh, to respond to your call for more role models, um, this initiative that signed up by 100 UK organizations from JP Morgan to Tesco to UK government has a specific screen that's looking on <coughs> role models selecting a uh, recruitment role models, female role models from across the pond to uh, have that direct conversation with uh, uh, young girls who is aspires for a career in tech um, beyond the AI. At last, the diversity and inclusion should be fostered at a global level. Um, I think what I've learned coming back from the AI for Good Summit um, in Geneva and several of us who were present there, with a truly diverse community they managed to assemble. They had um, close to 3,000 participants from 19 countries. And if you look at the pictures they have online, you will see the shared diversity of faces, on stage, off stage, people from Chile, Ghana, Togo. But they're all there to discuss how AI can make um, uh, everyone's life different. And I think uh, organizing of conferences like, like this um, can provide the, 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 the right context to invite those groups in a meaningful way, to go to diversity beyond gender and race and look at nationalities, have people from countries from the south, for example, but also uh, have some more um, you know, down to earth measures in terms of um, facilitating the presence of young researchers and entrepreneurs <coughs> from the same countries to conferences like NURI. So for example, last year, a lot of uh, researchers from Africa could not attend New Rips because they're not uh, provided visa by the uh, Canadian government. And I think by working with different governments to, to support those young researchers that sit in other, other parts of the world and the developed countries will ensure an even more diverse um, perspective into, into the development of AI. But ultimately, all those recommendations and case studies could only have a positive impact if we bring it all together and um, we are aware that they need to be uh, adapted to a local context, they need to be piloted before we roll it out. Um, all, all those initiatives we heard in ours and many others that exist 
They have uh, something in common. Um, the fact that co-designing and co-creating AI solutions are probably the best way to achieve uh, that flourishing of all of us together and the protection of the planet. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's very interesting. You really, you know, you've talked about the sort of overarching transformation model, if you like. But of course, uh, when you advise um, a, a client uh, in this area, um, it's not all in in the gift of the client to deliver. I mean, you you're saying that, that the government need to deliver, you know, digital literacy, uh, uh, support for young researchers, and so on. I mean. So, are we really saying that those who want to transform themselves uh, in this way and actually, you know, get to the uh, diversity and inclusion uh, uh, end game, so to speak, are, are they need, do they need to turn themselves into campaigners as well and and and, and put pressure on government to do, uh, you know, to do these things so that then actually culturally not just within the firm but outside uh, you know all the conditions are right I mean you know your 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 sort of model is really quite all-encompassing in a way isn't it yes I certainly I think um, we are advocates all of us um, and speak for diversity uh, in our own little or big world but I think what I found interesting is that the same mechanism from the uh, change management practice actually worked quite well. That top, top down and bottom up approach, the fact that we need the leaders to set up and create those opportunities because they understand the direction of organization, both private and public, but also they will have the resources. But that wouldn't happen if we wouldn't have the advocates, the ambassador that create that, that grassroots revolution that will actually allow the participation of, of those opportunities. And yes, it's not just the government. I think everyone who has a stand in society and is an active actor in society should be part of this. Government, big, big companies, think tanks and academia. I mean, ultimately, for AI to truly benefit society and humanity, we all have to participate. It's not just the ones who are in this building and in this table, but also people from all walks of life, in a meaningful way, of course. Mm -hmm. Because having true inclusion, it's, <coughs> it's kind of a daunting task. It's right. good to have people participate, but also it has to be in a meaningful way. And be able to act on the, 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 the feedback that provides. Fantastic. Which stimulates me to ask each in turn of our other members of the panel before we throw open um, to uh, uh, our um, wider audience. Um, you heard uh, Maria talk about you know the AI literacy debate. What government can do there? Uh, the young researcher agenda and so on. What for you is the absolute key government intervention, if there is one, that can actually really dramatically alter? Uh, where we are. Really. I, I would say that um, there's a difference between people who are opting into these programs, like code clubs and teams in AI, in terms of what we're doing, whereas um, in reality we're missing out on a whole generation of people and talent who are not opting in actively to do these things. What if we could take teams in AI as a program embedded into every school as part of the curriculum? or create the computer science curriculum in an interesting enough way that we are building climate change AI applications. And to do that, um, I think first the government needs to publish a skills roadmap of what it looks like for a diverse group of people from different age backgrounds, those who are professionals and looking to retrain themselves, and apprenticeship might not be the best suited tool for somebody who has had a long career, if what is the right mechanism or incentive. And then secondly, make sure that schools are equipped with, um, with the right mechanisms in place to continuously evolve and update the curriculum. And today we are talking about AI, in a, in a year's time it's going to be another buzzword and then there will be something else and so on. So you can ensure that the system is equipped to continuously update. And, um, and lastly, focus on the educators and the trainers themselves, whether these are managers, in businesses or whether these are trainers in schools. I think the government needs to do a lot more to enable them to, catch, to keep at place and not always try to play catch up because I feel like the concept is this catch up more, whether it's regulation or whether it's diversity or whether it's processes. So being more proactive, publishing these roadmaps, 
making sure there's enough capacity for these new generation technologies is critical. And that's part of a kind of national retraining campaign, agenda, project, I mean, which is up that's still a beginning to um, uh, come into the daylight. Yeah, I think probably a more glamorous word than uh, national retraining because I think um, reskilling, re re-skilling. upskilling. Well, yes. that's why we'll have a we'll have, we'll have a competition. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, something more continuous. That's uh, that's always uh, always ongoing and uh, making sure that all segments of society can benefit from that. Thank you. Okay. okay, and I think um, kind of pulling back on what we mentioned before again using that data in the course of that research, but also then taking that data. I know in the previous talks we talked about, um, you know, I think it was the CDO from TFL who talked about the use of data for public good, you know, whether that be medical data, whether that be gender data about, you know, diversity, you know, targets and things like that, and ensuring that we use it in a proactive way, um, but also make sure we're monitoring that, so strong data governance and um, make sure anything that you know, find the right frameworks to it. So, so we have a number of trusted AI frameworks to make sure anything that's being produced and used um, is being monitored carefully. And that's both in corporations but also externally. So, Adrian, what are you telling the cabinet office now, this? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, you know, the, the challenge that we have in, in AI, I don't think it's so different from the challenge we have in tech, you know, for, for a very long time. So I do think we need to think of, of different ways of engaging particularly young, young people, and um, so I think you mentioned Stamets and Anne-Marie Maffedon. I think the model that she uses to engage you know, young girls at the age of nine or so who are making decisions about you know, their future careers, and there are three Fs that she talks about, you know, uh, why, why they should consider a, a, a tech um, a career. First is food. You know, you've got lots of great food in Google and Amazon and everywhere else. Really, really good. It's all free. Uh, second is it, lots of fun, but importantly, the third F is that you're going to make a lot more money, so the funds. And so I think we need to find ways of communicating at the right ages and in the right ways that make it a lot more accessible to the young people that we're trying to attract. And it is you know, at that age that they're making these decisions. Thank you. Sarah? Um, so I want to talk about how the education system has to be reformed or even transformed. Um, we're still running on the same methods being taught back in Victorian times, like learning, writing essays, and like being tested continuously. I think it has to be a lot more problem-solving based and be, make, making sure that those are able to be adaptable to the new modern world. I think the education system has to really ensure that skills for the digital world are being <coughs> developed. Um, whether that is being adaptable, I think this whole thing about learning to learn, um, having creative thinking, problem solving. Do you, think, uh, do you think AI itself has a role in that in, that, in terms of personalising education and so Yeah, um, I think AI can definitely personalise education, ensuring that like, no one in the classroom is left behind, everyone can learn and learn at their own pace. But I think it's the way that it's taught, it's the fact that we have to learn these facts and then regurgitate them back onto a piece of paper. And it's like, it doesn't really work. Like, we have Google now, you can like search something that you want to know. Like, that's about it. That's why we need loads of young people to be able to like have problem solving skills and especially entrepreneurial skills. So as you mentioned, like funding and everything, like we need those people that will later on be able to go into the future and set up their own company and give back to the communities. Whether that's doing it through an organisation like Teens and AI or having programmes at school where these skills are developed. And this is why I think like, the big role that the government has is to start off by transforming its education system. And you think that starts right at the beginning of secondary education? No, I think it starts in primary. Starts in primary? Yeah. Um, like you have where you get the most attention for girls to go into, uh, into STEM careers is when they're really young. Like, you buy different gendered like, people different toys to play with. Like, you give girls dolls and you give boys engineering kits. Like, that's why it starts at primary school, like, even in the homes. But I think primary school is a good way where it should be targeted. Thank you. Josie. Um, so I think building on what you just said, Sarah, I think there's something about, there's definitely pipeline issues, but there's no point having a strong pipeline when the environment that, you know, young women end up finding themselves in is inherently hostile to them. 
So I think there's something around um, in terms of what government can do about ensuring you know, tech companies you know, provide safe, warm, you know, places you actually want to work as a young woman where you're not just encountering misogyny all the time. Um, I think there's something maybe in the procurement processes that mandates teams that are diverse Good in various point. ways. Yeah. Um, so using, using government dollars uh, as much as possible to really push in that direction. And, and then I think reflecting on citizen participation, with the GDS service standards, there's a requirement to do user research with, so the people who end up using your service that you want to digitalize in some way, you need to talk to them and find out what their needs are um, and their views on this change that you're proposing to the service. That's great. Service specific stuff like that is really important. But I think with technologies, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, I think a lot of people in the public think, well, I don't have a PhD in physics, so I couldn't possibly understand what that's all about and disengage. So there's something about broader citizen engagement by government about you know, this is what the technology is, come and play with it, we'll explain it to you, we'll gather your views at the same time around what role this technology you want, what role you want this technology to play in your community. So I think there's a broader societal conversation we're not having. I think we're all assuming AI is great and we should just deploy it, but we're not actually asking <laughs> the people whose services yeah. are going to be automated, for example, whether that's what they want. Is that the kind of society that you want to live in and you want your taxpayers, your tax dollars to be spent on? So, great, thank you. Right, well, I'm going to throw it open. And really, what I'm looking for is kind of um, a personal experience of change, trying to make, uh, make change of uh, areas of difficulty, uh, comments on uh, government policy implementation, comments on uh, culture change and so on. Bogey, if you want to come in. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, I, I've really enjoyed uh, the presentations. I think we've talked a lot about the gender issue and the education issue, and we talked about being cook producers and cook designers, cook creators, puzzle solvers, problem solvers, and, and we talked very much about the development of the AI. But when it comes to the adoption of the AI, I think we might think a little bit broader when in the digital age, when we talk about the digital divide, it was all about how many have a computer, how many are online, uh, you know, how many can use email, how many search the internet, how many use uh, uh, it at work, etc. And I think we might, we might have to think about some kind of benchmarks in which we can actually measure AI adoption. And I don't think that would, that would be about getting people just to play with it. I think that so far as I'm Scandinavian, they are adopting, they give every single house a broadband. That's it. Then they have quickly the adoption starts. What is it that we can do here in the UK for enabling the adoption? So now I'm talking about the AI divide as if it was a digital divide, literally that we all know how to use AI and for that we don't need to know anything about how to program or anything. It's literally can we use our Alexia right? Can we use our internet of things right? Do we know how to so, uh, run our intelligent home and say, you know, what is it that government can do to, uh, to speed up adoption? Great, I'll uh, park that one and we'll come back to that. I'll take another couple of questions or comments. Yes. Uh, so, I just wanted to, uh, it's sort of in line with what you're saying, I mean, one of the key um, ages when the adoption <coughs> should be happening is actually in primary schools. Um, I'm actually teaching AI at university. I mean, if you, if you look at What's happening in primary schools, right? For example, this is where people are being left out, and how do you do it without invading their personal space, invading the children's space, uh, personal freedom as well? I think the best way, one of the most recent Nobel Prizes was given for nudging, and I think the best way to, to <coughs> nudge people, especially children in primary schools from underprivileged backgrounds, is by giving them, uh, by replacing calculators with Python uh, programming language on something like Raspberry Pi. That would effectively nudge them. Why are we, for example, giving them calculators when it's effectively outdated technology, right? But, uh, if we do them at, at the most basic level, Python, which is which is the lingua franca of uh, AI nowadays, um, it's a calculator at the most basic level. So they can start using it as a calculator. They can start submitting ho ho homework as Jupyter notebooks, for example, and that would be a very clean early stage transition to AI technology. Thank you. And I hope yes. yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, the cultural face or cultural voice on AI. Lots of the AI come as a have a human image, like Alexa. It answers with a female voice, and then that has been found that those kind of AI supposed to serve you, supposed to be kind of your maid, your servant, 
they have a female face or female voice. While the ones give you command, give you warnings, they have a male voice, particularly in you know, uh, car navigation. Quite a lot of them give you command. Then they have a male voice. So this is a quite interesting, subtly uh, inherit the old stereotype in the old culture. So I think that is a bit problematic from a feminist point of view. Why it reinforce the old image in a new generation technology? And then in AI, for example, you can ask Siri or ask Alexa some inappropriate questions, right? And the answer is the program to be quite obedient. It didn't say, hey, you shouldn't ask me this. This is the wrong question. It says, ha, ah, kind of the, kind of laugh a bit, kind of a, kind of giggles, and then kind of a, uh, kind of nicely, kind of a sneak away from that kind of uh, inappropriate questions. So I feel that AI itself has a culture. It inherited sort of the, the male dominant kind of cultural norm that needed to be re. Exact. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get the panel to reflect on that. I'm sure they'll have uh, uh, quite uh, uh, similar thoughts to yours on that. Um, so, first of all, the whole question of, of adoption of AI, uh, the sort of the equivalent of the digital divide in AI. Um, uh, you know, whether we adopt sort of benchmarks, uh, as uh, Bogita has suggested, and the whole question of nudging uh, uh, and, and in terms of encouraging. The adoption. I mean, um, I think uh, you were talking about Python, or certainly in your CV, there's quite a lot of Python, Sarah. I think isn't that this Sarah over here? Yeah, uh, uh, amongst other things, maybe you can elucidate all that and whether that would nudge some of your uh, colleagues. Um, uh, let's start the other end. Let's go to Maria first on any of those items. Well, AI adoption is is a tricky one. So. Um, what we've been looking at is where is AI operating, in which context, and what does it mean to, to, to go like wildfire, right? And I know there are some prerequisites that need to be in place, they range from not just um, data and good quality data, uh, but also cultural <coughs> consideration, but also really important, the structure of the organization, the right skills, the integration with other technologies. So when we'll have those building in place, the adoption of the AI, will take us all by surprise and go um, like, like wildfire. I want to bring the conversation back into, into diversity and, and the fact to respond to your point earlier. Um, I, I think definitely AI is a mirror, so it inherits everything we are, right? And actually Pe Pedro Domingo was the one that said something really interesting. Uh, we see AI not as it, as it is, but as we are. So if we, keep, we, if we start with that in mind, if we are aware that this is what we, what we encode in AI, we have the first chance to start addressing it. Until the acknowledgement, nothing significant will, will, will change. And we also get, have to give us a little bit of room, right? Because nine pregnant women cannot give birth to a child in a month. So let's give us a little bit more space to address all this. We are talking about you know, prejudices that come centuries. So we can't solve it in a few months, in a few years. We have to understand how to solve it. And what does it mean? What means it, 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 it quality of sexes? Does anyone know what's the right ratio when we hire people? What's the, it's 50 50? Maybe, in some cases, maybe not. So we don't know. So let's give us a little bit of time to assess that. Um, while the adoption of AI happens, and we need to be feeling those, so it's kind of a bit of a how do we juggle the two? That rapid growing that adoption and issues that have been um, our concern for millennia. Thank you. Josie? Um, so that's, I think it's a really interesting question around speeding up the adoption of AI um, and comparing it to broadband. So I think, I mean, broadband I consider in terms of a utility. Um, it's like water, you can just kind of eat it now. Um, and whereas with artificial intelligence, I wouldn't necessarily think about that as a utility. If we are living in that space and think that well, AI should be accessible to everybody from a utility perspective, there's a real requirement for government to make sure we've got a legal framework that that can happen in a way that safeguards privacy is transparent. Because if you think about how our personal data is currently being mined by companies like Google and Microsoft, 
and then sold on to third parties, and it's, it's all captured by a private enterprise. Um, that's not how we set up utilities, really, in terms of safeguarding people's access, their privacy, and all those sorts of things. I think there's a lot of ethical issues around how AI is currently used in society that need to be resolved by government legislation so that it is safe to have AI as a utility. It's safe to have an Alexa in your home. You, don't, you know that there's no one back at Amazon listening to your conversation, for example. Yeah. You know that data doesn't actually leave your Amazon device, for example. So I think there's thinking about what does that legal framework need to look like to safeguard our human rights and our liberties if we want AI to become a utility. Um, which I think, I don't necessarily think is a good or bad thing, but I think we haven't necessarily delved enough into it to really um, understand the impacts. And on the cultural face of AI, the Alexa, I mean, that's, <laughs> we live in patriarchy, um, so of course, uh, designing personal assistance as women is, comes really easily. And I think that's when we have homogenous teams. So we didn't, so I think you can assume that uh, in the rooms that develop these technologies, you've got your really smart, you know, data scientists, your coders, all these really clever people, but they don't have degrees in political science. They're not, you know, they haven't necessarily had their feminist awakening yet. Um, it'll come, I'm sure. But um, so how do we add more people into the room to actually challenge and go, I know you think that there's nothing wrong with representing, you know, uh, a voice assistant in this way, but actually these are the cultural implications and we have a whole body of social science to, to demonstrate the harms that this has. Um, so given that, what design choices can we make differently? And actually, with the, what you quoted in terms of, um, you know, Alexa and Siri are not programmed to um, deal with sexual harassment in any kind of positive, assertive way, they're pretty much going to giggle and go, oh, don't talk to me like that, so well, but, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, what, after that research came out, that really criticised that, that really poor response to sexual harassment. Amazon, I think, have started redesigning that. So Amazon's Alexa will disengage if um, the person using the device engages in sexual harassment with the, the bot. So that's quite impressive. That now that that's been alerted to them, they want to change it and make it better. So I think it's, again, like you said, we're, we're, we're growing, we're figuring out. Um, but yeah, calling out those things is, is really important. And also, why does it need to be a human? Like it's, it's a robot. Why can't it just be a robot? Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. So? Um, so I wanted to touch about what Jensen mentioned earlier and um, talk about if it's a need now for computer science to be uh, mandatory, like English and maths. Is that something that we want to go into, into um, looking at our digital world? And I don't think it's about having like a lesson which is just computer science, but embedding it into all the other subjects that are already already in the system. So like in English class, like learn how to use Word and like different software like this, or in geography, I know there's loads of good mapping resources and um, open code that can be used. In maths and statistics in particular, like you can already be using R Studio, which is a kind of programming language. Um, to set our ideas like that. So I think it can already be incorporated in different ways. That's maybe not just learning Python or learning a certain language. And just to touch upon the Alexa thing, I think it's quite popular. Um, but there is a company called the Feminist Internet, which are already really trying to push forward and break these stereotypes. In What's the, the company called? Um, the Feminist Internet. And um, they release podcasts, and actually, currently, they're working on a voice um, device which is gender neutral, so you can't distinguish whether it's a man or a woman. Maybe that's a step forward that we want to take. And it was quite an interesting research that um, BMW did with their cars. So they didn't actually have a certain voice that was already built into the system. When you started up your car, you had to pick uh, what type of voice you wanted. And um, men wanted men because they did not want to be bossed around by men wow. in their cars, obviously. And um, women wanted more light voices because they thought it was friendlier and um, nicer to talk to. So I think just in that, you can tell the differences between what people want to pick and whether they have a choice to pick that or not. Yeah, thank you. So. I'm going to take a slightly different stance, although I agree with all the points just mentioned. But I'm actually going to talk about um, those probably in the, what you call the low-tech community. So I've spent some time um, 
uh, presenting at events with women from like disadvantaged backgrounds and also um, you know part of the and the LD you know, just after retirement and things like that. And those are sometimes the, the people we actually need to support the most because actually those are the ones that are the most risk from kind of slightly not having access to even the computer. So I think you know MPs and councils need to be very conscious of those in that society and <coughs> making classroom training accessible, you know, scholarships, night schools, um, even encouraging schools where they're training the kids in getting into AI to do that voluntary experience. So like Duke of Edinburgh and things like that wasn't really rewarding because it actually encourages you to go back into society. So you actually have this kind of ecosystem where corporations have the responsibility of providing those scholarships maybe to universities and schools and equally then those schools and perhaps help those in other parts of the community. So this kind of life cycle of by helping three people and those three people help three people that kind of builds into the pay it forward structure. I mean we've got an urgent question here, haven't we really, in terms of digital literacy. I mean, you know, we have got an education system, you know, both primary and secondary schools doesn't really recognise the digital world at all by the time of it in that sense. And you know, you're saying that as a result, if you're not careful, you, you come out of it and you've got, uh, you, you know, the digital divide, basically. Um, I, I mean, how, how are we going to kind of get a greater sense of urgency? Because it can't all just be voluntary action and, you know, uh, that, that, that takes place. There's got to be something much more uh, programmed. Well, I'm a strong believer in um, creating shared value, so the notion that businesses um, whilst yes, they should be profitable, they also should be thinking about how they give back to society. So if you're not familiar with that concept, then please check out my reporter. And I could go into a whole talk about that now, but the notion here is that you know, corporations should be thinking, okay, how do my actions impact society and how am I making sure that I do something positive? So when we talk about, you know, tech, 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 tech can, you know, it's great to have, you know, nearly one, we have the equivalent to make sure we're having a positive impact on society and actually helping those, whether they're the most vulnerable people or actually um, the ones who are going to be the next future leaders probably sitting around me now, um, to then be able to do so. Um, and that's working with the government, so groups like this and approaching people like yourselves to say actually we've recognised, we've looked at the data, we've analysed the data and we found actually 30% of the people in X community don't even have access to 4G internet. Yeah. How are they meant to do these free online courses when they can't even access good internet? Mm. How, when the public libraries are shutting down, how are people who can't afford to have a computer in that <coughs> going to access it? How are we going to make it that schools, universities, places like that do have facilities are then accessible to those who, don't, who can't afford to go? So those are kind of the, the, the large questions that we may need. You just want to comment, I completely agree. I think it's actually the fact that in this country here that each household has a router to get the internet. Like, you know, if you come from Scandinavia, it's quite a shock. Because each house is like a big tunnel of broadband coming in, it's automatically already put into the house. And to the student accommodation, here you're sitting in the routers. <laughs> Going to the 5G fleet, but that's another separate topic. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go get on to that. You might, you might uh, get President Trump objecting to what we have to say. Uh, appreciate you. Um, I, I actually understand your point about businesses taking leadership and communicating, but um, lately I've been, I've been doing a lot of thinking on this topic and how much impact good businesses can have. And yes, it's tremendous, but it doesn't reach everyone. It doesn't reach those segments of society. And therefore, I think the government needs to do a lot better than that. And, and I think that there's, yes, there's deeper partnership involved. I think the partnership needs to be more at skills level because if you look at how much computer science, how much data scientists get paid in the private sector versus um, it, the typical salaries in public sector, civil society, or private sector, it's a huge difference. And therefore, we need to figure out more interesting, <coughs> smarter ways of that collaboration and giving people the opportunities. But I don't think the, the solution is company X, so for example, Google pledging one billion and, and, uh, and saying they're doing this work to work philanthropy on, but they're not paying taxes and things like that could be into the system, that's a problem. When it comes to measuring AI adoption, one segment I think we really need to do a lot more work for is the small businesses in the community. I've worked a lot for many large organizations and many people on this table have, but um, not every small business has the 
opportunity to have an AI program driver or a VP of AI research. And yes, we have a booming startup sector in this country, but when it comes to small businesses who are creating a lot of jobs and, and providing a lot of solutions, they are still grappling with issues around connectivity and digitization digitization and online taxes, and therefore AI is not something that's top of the mind. There needs to be deeper, more incentivized policies for small businesses to make sure that they are not left behind. Um, on your point on the personalities of AI, I see it's really bad design um, when people create these kind of tools. And similar to Josie's process, I, I sat in many of the design conversations that actively shut down bad products that are sexist or racist or do not pass a bias detection test. So I just think a, a very fundamental process we can embed in the, in, the, in the methodology of creating software is making sure that at the very least it's not easy to sexist, racist, or biased in any way. Great, thank you. Well, if we're really quick, I think we can get two short, sharp questions in. One, two, quickest hands. Yeah. No, make it three, <laughs> just to be a bit more diverse. <laughs> I've got the opening paragraph from an email I sent this morning. Uh, Dear Francis, I'm writing to share a new program of work from Nesta, the UK's Innovation Foundation. The 4.6 million partnership with the UK Department for Education will support <coughs> schools and colleges to make more effective use of technology, etc. Et that was as of this morning, wasn't it? 11.39 a.m. GMT. Very good. Hope that you heard it here first. <laughs> or, or we heard it here first. Thank you. I mean, is this a program that's been in the offing for some time? or? Um, I know Nesta had an AI for Education uh, event about a month ago I attended, so, you know, not Nesta will probably be the first port of call. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, panel may want to comment on that. And then we have one in the middle. Uh, yes, Alex Hasley from Selwyn, uh, Andrew Selwyn. Uh, we're a small machine learning company, rapidly expanding at the moment. Uh, we're actively trying to hire more women in the team, quite diverse as far as race and uh, nationality. So, what would be the one piece of practical advice that you could give me and a company like Southern that's actionable today to try to uh, encourage more women to uh, you know, apply to work workers? How many, how many jobs have you got? Find great women. And thirdly, Lady Evelyn. Um, I was just wondering whether uh, now uh, you believe that you know, I think we've got a massive opportunity to perhaps engage the elderly community with AI. Uh, I think the government should be doing more to help to use AI in that community to help some of the problems that we've got already, and we're going to have a lot more of in the next kind of 10, 15 years. Um, I was struck by the um, the ad recently, I think it's for Alexa on the telly where, you know, it's reminding the elderly chap to uh, take his medicine or something. And, and actually, you know, a huge opportunity, I think, exists for broader adoption, but the government's got to help, I think, by getting those AI uh, opportunities into the elderly community through the NHS or the care homes or wherever. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Right, well, we'll just take comments, I think, as you like it, so to speak, um, uh, of what you've heard, of, you know, especially, I think, that the recruitment advice over there, uh, save yourself a headhunter or two, um, I think is the, the answer. Chrissy, uh, do you want to kick off? Yeah, uh, so first of all, thanks for raising that question. I know you've already hired Alejandro, who's amazing, and a great champion of pretty much every woman in AI in London. So that's good. Um, I would um, I would just say it's always um, it's often quite difficult to be the first woman leader in an organization. And I often hear from startups who are like, we really want to change our leadership structure, come and talk to us. And if you ever go and talk to like five male co-founders looking for the first woman. And um, I, I think it needs to it needs to start much early on because I don't want to go into a startup and fix their diversity problem. Right. Um, so the sooner you can start, the better. Um, the second thing, you've hired great male champions in this field, which is awesome, and you're here caring about this issue, and that matters a lot. The more you can expand about what problems you're solving in a language that impacts humans and 
explains the impact of your work on actual society. Um, that would be much appreciated. I would rather apply to a job that says we are going to improve the life, quality of life for the elderly using AI than something that says we're going to improve the efficiency of your cloud computing software. A <laughs> um, lot of notes there. <laughs> yeah. So. First of all, I'm going to offer you a free ticket to, I run a community group called Developer, which is a non-for-profit women tech group. We take women from all different backgrounds, so they could be people just getting into tech, or they could be experienced, experienced women such as myself, and we're running a breakfast session at um, the AI Summit. So I'm going to give you a free ticket to come along, um, and on the, on the panel there we have a selection of amazing women, um, you know, heads of different departments, but equally in the crowd we have a load of women who basically either want jobs in AI and are interested to see how to take the next step in the career ladder. So I think I'm going to offer you that, but the key part there is um, there's lots of community groups. So I, I've listed developer, but you know, there's women who code and so many different ones. And I always recommend being part of these kind of groups. And, and equally like taking them like when they're kind of rising up because I think there is a shortage, there's no point pretending there isn't. Um, but I think it's about seeing the potential and, and often the, the people who I found, both men and women, who become the most amazing coders or employees are the ones who are, I've invested that time in. Um, and even the ones I've mentored now, some of them are like heads of different departments and they can kick my ass and have coding competitions and now I'm, I'm there teaching, teaching me. But that shows the full cycle of so. You're going to be inundated with applicants now. Um, Sarah, you're not in the job market, sadly, yet, are you? <laughs> so, <do they? laughs> um, so, as I mentioned previously, I think the use of language is, um, and how you sell uh, your like people who want you get who want to get in. I think Microsoft did a study, and so have Google. It's just like if you tell someone we're going to come and build this a certain demographic of people are going to come. But if you go and tell them, we're going to make this good for the world, we're going to do all these other great things, a lot more women tend to come. So I think it's like the use of language that you might want to look at. And um, then talking about uh, the elderly and how we want to encourage them, I think Japan do a really good job at doing it. They spend so much money and so much time looking at human-centered design. Um, which is very crucial for all those who are not techie based that want to just get, be involved with using these kinds of technologies. So they have loads of mini robots which remind people to take their medication, that bring them water at night, that tell them when to get up and like go on their walks, things like that. And I think other good devices are like Fitbits and Apple Watches as you mentioned, like tracks your heartbeat, how many walk, like how long you walked in one day, what your sleep pattern is like. And it's not just beneficial to the user, but also to that collection of data. Like, if the NHS was to take the data from all those home Fitbits, they'd be able to tell and predict pretty well who's more likely to get heart disease and who isn't. So all these different kinds of things. And just one thing that I wanted to pick up on, which is like, I think we need to remember that AI is a tool that we have. It's not something that's telling us what to do. And I think it's really important that like, we have all these cultural and social issues, but we don't need AI to tell us that. Like, we can walk into a room and be like, oh, we're missing diversity here. Like, we don't need a machine telling us that this is a problem. Like, you can see it with your eyes if you speak to people. Great, thank you. Josie? So I'm eyeing her up to hire her, so... <laughs> 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 I'd be the same. <laughs> Um, so I think there's definitely actively generating a pipeline, um, but then there's also thinking about what structures or mechanisms do you have in place to, um, if someone does enter the workforce, <coughs> your workplace, sorry, and then leaves, it's a woman, you know, contacting them and finding out why, and really being kind of an active listener and think, reflecting, okay, you know, we need to change this <coughs> and that kind of company so that the next person that comes in feels welcome, supported, and, and doesn't leave. Um, I think as well, and also echoing what Kriti said, um, you know, don't sort of make them feel like, you know, they represent all women and they have to like solve the diversity problem and what's, you know, about the team and what, what do you need as part of the team to be supported and that kind of stuff. Um, and there's also, there are so many resources online about, you know, creating women friendly workplaces that I'm sure will be comfortable. Um, in terms of, you know, using AI to help support um, sort of elderly population, I know there's a lot of, well not a lot, I think there's a handful of councils who have 
trialling Alexa skills to help support um, the elderly population as part of adult social care services. And I think they um, have been collaborating quite closely with Amazon, and so those Alexa skills have particular privacy settings as well. So again, another example of kind of innovation around privacy and, and voice bots and stuff like that. So I think it is it is happening slowly, and the benefit of government driving this is I think once the service kind of, I guess has been established for one council, it could easily be rolled out across other councils, and, and that can be shared. Um, yeah, right. there's a lot of work going on there. Yeah, thank you. Um, Final words, Maria. How come I have always the final words? So, um, great points on how to, to attract um, the scientists. But I think, just to sum it up, it's all in, in culture, create a culture that it's in, not just inclusive, but female friendly, that acknowledges that we have a different body rhythm, we, have, we work in a different way, we are more emotional. So, and um, on top of it, I think it's it's, it's really important, as Kriti said, uh, is uh, send a message that technology can be used for, 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 for the good of society. What we learned when we set up Tech She Can is that a lot of the young girls were not aware, for example, technology can help society. And therefore, I think it's important not just for all of us to engage in initiatives like uh, helping addressing the SDG Sustainable Development Goals, but also be able to communicate that. Because that's a big selling point. If I were to change my, my workplace, I think I'll go to a place where I know they are committed towards of benefiting to society in a meaningful way. And secondly, it's a fun culture to be in. Ultimately, we are people working with people. So we, as, as Sarah said, we don't need machines to tell us what's wrong with us. We could just look at each other and acknowledge that. I think ultimately the point about elderly, um, I think there's a, a brilliant researcher in MIT, um, I think it's her name, it's uh, Tucker, I think. She has been doing a lot of research in um, understanding the connection that happens in between uh, old people and um, AI power tools like robots and toys. But I'm a big skeptic about that because we have to acknowledge the, the social context um, around elderly people and the fact that there's an epidemic of loneliness and then we have a growing number of people suffering with depression, Alzheimer. Those are not, not issues to be addressed by technologies. It's more about human contact. How can we pair up people like Sarah, teens in AI, in some sort of a reverse mentorship to, to, to look after you know, our elderly? And I know. Um, Netherlands have piloted something similar. It's like pairing students who are looking for accommodation, for example, with elderly who will have who will live in a in home cares. I just set up those, you know, amazing relationships that will benefit both. And I think we have to be looking stop you know, running to technology and helping to solve the problem that generated because of we are not interacting with each other enough. I think ultimately AI will benefit us if we are we will remember we are humans and we need each other. That's it. Thank you very much, Maria. And you tempt me to introduce uh, Julia Jones, who's just written a book called The Music Diet, uh, which is, shows the power of music with things like Alzheimer's, mental health, uh, and the elderly. And so uh, you're absolutely right. It's those kind of human things, which uh, choirs, you know, singing, uh, which could have as much impact as, as technology. Uh, for that age group as well. So thank you very much indeed. And I thought the wider message about demonstrating the societal benefit isn't all about the tech, you know, just saying they can solve, you know, the, the, those sort of tech problems. It's got to have a wider societal context. Yeah, that's how we're going to attract a much broader cohort of people into uh, uh, all the various uh, 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 developers and you know, those who are applying um, AI communities. So, um, some really important messages, I think, today. Um, thank you very much to our panel. We've had a very diverse discussion about diversity, I think one can say. Um, Kriti, thank you. Sarah, Sarah, Josie, and Maria, thank you very much indeed.